And Chef's going to show you a little bit of tempering. I've got a little bit of warm chocolate. So when you're tempering chocolate, initially uh, you need to melt the chocolate to 40 to 45 degrees, which is enough for the fat particles to uh, completely melt so that you don't have a bloom later. Bloom is basically when you see little white dots on your chocolate. Yeah. And uh, this chocolate is quite warm. And for even uh, if you're tempering the chocolate at home, then uh, I would suggest you would use a temperature probe or a thermometer so you can actually uh, measure the temperature of the chocolate so that you don't end up burning. That's right, because there's a lot of, it's, it's quite a detailed process, isn't yes. it? You've got to be really careful with the temperature measuring yeah. um, and the time measuring so that you get it perfectly tempered. Oh, this is my favorite part. <laughs> I'm not tempting much chocolate. We'll do a little bit. Okay. Beautiful. So you just want to move it around, don't you, to bring the temperature down? Yes. And what temperature are you looking at? I would bringing it down. Bringing to? it down to about 28. 28. And then reheating it about till 32, mm -hmm. which is close to your body temperature. Right. So even if you don't have a thermometer, you should just feel the chocolate in your hand. If it's you feel that it's close to your body temperature, then it's probably uh, the fat uh, molecules mm -hmm. have completely emulsified and you get that viscosity that you need to you know, put it in molds and make your own callets or garnishes and to get that perfect snap that, that just breaks yeah. and that shine. Yeah, right. Has anyone, anyone ever tried to temper chocolate at home? Uh, you have? How did it go? It worked? Almost, almost. Anyone else? Same. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing about it. It's a, you've got to practice with it. It's, it's not something that happens straight away, but it's one of those things that after you do practice a few times and get it right, that's one of the best feelings. I think you see that shine on the chocolate and you hear the snap. It's so very, as you can yeah. see that the chocolate is almost setting, mm -hmm. which is because the marble is cold. And also the chocolate temperature is coming down. So if I don't use it now for making garnishes, it will probably set. Okay, so that's that's another thing. You've got to be quick, don't you? It's yes. Yeah. Uh, I I actually tried my hand at tempering a couple of times. Why don't um, you tell them about the masterclass? Yes, master the masterclass. Masterchef experience. Yes. I don't know if anyone remembers. There was an episode uh, where I did a passion flower. So it was a white chocolate flower, uh, actually similar to one of the menu items here at Fabel, a beautiful flower that opens when a hot sauce is poured around the outside. So we had to temper the white chocolate petals for that dessert and uh, we had to do it in a microwave. So a little bit different, uh, not your traditional method, but in a plastic bowl in the microwave, back and forth, stopping the microwave and coming back to your bench and doing another part of the recipe, going back to the microwave, so a lot of running back and forth. Um, but I found... For me, that, that sort of uh, method worked. Uh, it's just you've got to be really careful, I think. When you're using a microwave, you can easily overheat it. Uh, and it was white chocolate. There are a few people that overheated it and it caramelized in the microwave. Um, but definitely worth having a try if you've got a microwave, um, tempering it that way. Just so that's a, a cheap code off from the master chef herself <laughs> that you can use a microwave with short bursts <laughs> and keeping yeah. the temperature low so yes. you can get a perfect tempered chocolate even at home yes. and you don't need a setup of a bain marie with some water and you need to put a yes. glass bowl on it or a metal bowl so you can just do it in a microwave yeah it's a great way to do it yes. so and, and you just need to take care that it's just under observation yes always watching always, always watching, watching. <laughs> perfect so we have something called as the Billy's secret to tempering chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Always watching. So there are three main types of chocolate. Thank you for that tempering demonstration, by the way. That was great. Thank you. Three main types of chocolate, as you can see on the screens now. Uh, milk chocolate, which is your cocoa mass uh, added with milk powder and sugar. Dark chocolate, which is pretty much the pure chocolate. There's no milk powder added, so it's actually a great um, chocolate for a lactose-free diet, yes. if anyone needed that. Um, and it's just that little bit more healthy, I suppose, dark chocolate. It has antioxidants. Yeah, Everybody's it's looking great for you, Anti-aging properties as well. Yes. Uh, and finally, white chocolate, which is cocoa butter, milk powder, and sugar, um, which 
Some people say it's not really chocolate, white chocolate, but I like to think that it is because we we use it so much these days in, in dessert making and sweet making and it does have a fundamental ingredient of chocolate in it which is cocoa butter. So I, I don't discriminate, I like to think that it's all chocolate. <laughs> yes, so let's just ask from the audience, um, how many people like dark chocolate? Ooh, quite a lot of yeah, them. Quite a lot, quite, quite a lot. A lot. Yeah, and what about milk chocolate? I think we we all like milk, I think, but we, yeah. So what do people like in Australia? Well, Australia, I think, were liking milk chocolate for a long time because that's sort of, that was what was popular. Um, but the trends sort of shifted and we've, I think we're starting to appreciate dark chocolate a lot more because of the tasting notes, because you can taste different flavours in it. It's not just that standard milk chocolate flavour. Right. Um, so that's where we're going. That's certainly my favourite, dark chocolate. So I think Australia, that's the way we're moving. And I'm, th I'm thinking India is probably, by the look of the show of hands, um, going more along the dark, dark chocolate path. Dark chocolate yes. lane, yes. Yeah, that's so great. As you can see, uh, there are three types of chocolate, milk, white and dark. And the mi common <coughs> applications of these are your bars, mousse, beverage, and ganache. Also outside, you can taste all of these uh, along the cocoa journey. We have a very nice mousse which we've made and you can taste how light it is. And for the beverage, nowadays people, instead of using uh, ready-to-use cocoa powders, you can actually make beverages from cocoa or the application chocolates. So we've made the beverage. Please do and have a taste of it to experience the actual chocolate in making a beverage. And then we have ganache. Yeah, so we'll have to taste all of those um, when we're in there because there is so much, so much to taste out there. I think we actually have another trivia question. Wow. Uh, yeah, so another bag of Which chocolate. country is the largest Ooh, producer of cocoa? Ivory Coast. Oh, wow. So good. <laughs> so good. So Everyone, good. Yeah, this is a good group. It produces 30% of the cocoa. <laughs> but 30%. 30%. So that's a large amount, yes. isn't it? A large amount. Why don't <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so all of those different uh, regions, they yeah. they must produce different flavors. Yes. So uh, cocoa is produced in tropical regions because of the climatic condition, mm -hmm. the soil, and the climatic condition and the soil provides a particular flavor to each region. For example, uh, the cocoa producing countries are Ghana, Madagascar, Venezuela, Sandomen, uh, Sao Tome and Ivory Coast as well. And each chocolate is different because of the flavour notes that are imparted through the soil into the chocolate. Very similar to uh, what happens to a wine uh, in terms of the yeah, grape. I find that very interesting yes. um, when we start talking about single origins is that Something so simple as the soil can change the flavour notes in the chocolate. Right. Yeah. So your Madagascar chocolate would be a little fruity and floral. Your Ghana would have strong cocoa notes, whereas a Venezuelan would be a little woody. Mm -hmm. And by the way, which is your favourite? My favourite at the moment is the Madagascar chocolate um, because I think as an eating chocolate, so as opposed to a cooking chocolate, um, the cocoa notes are quite mild but the fruity notes in it are really they really stand out so it's um, a really interesting one to eat. Um, Fabel actually does a great beverage pairing um, idea with the chocolates yes. and jasmine tea has actually been paired with the Madagascan chocolate which is really interesting. There's Madagascan chocolate in the cocoa journey wow. room which you'll be able to try and I believe there's some jasmine tea set up um, in the catering section so if you get a chance definitely try those together. <laughs> okay. And um, while you taste chocolates just let uh, the chocolate piece yeah. melt in your mouth. Do not chew on it. That is when uh, the flavours completely come out and just let your body temperature melt the chocolate and then you can have a sip of beverage and it will complement each other perfectly. It sounds wonderful. I think everyone will want to be doing that I think. <laughs> No, very good. Definitely. Yeah, so in Australia, um, on that beverage pairing, we do a lot of uh, wine pairing with chocolate, particularly red wine, because the notes, as um, we mentioned earlier, in, in wine and chocolate, there's some that overlap. So you've got your fruity notes or your woody notes, 
Um, and you get that same sort of thing in chocolate, which is really, really interesting and something for Belle is looking at doing yes, soon. Yeah, to um, do a wine and chocolate tasting. So two of my favourite things. I'm sure everyone can ag agree with that. Um, so that would be pretty exciting. That would be pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned before about the applications <laughs> of chocolate. So the mousse yes. and the beverages um, and the ganache as well was something that really struck me with Fabel. Um, ganache, as you can see on the screen, the bowl of ganache is sort of what... Um, the I traditional guess, way? Yeah, the traditional way, what everyone thinks of when you think of a ganache. It's used as a cake covering or a cake filling and is usually in its liquid form. Um, but what Fabel has done and what I can't get enough of, I think it's amazing, is the uh, boxed ganache. So this has sort of turned that product into a confectionery, so something that you can eat, that you can share. Um, <coughs> and the way that it's actually made uh, ensures that the shelf life of that product is long, but it still remains a really delicate, um, velvety, silky smooth texture. Uh, so yeah, one of my favourite is that ganache. <laughs> wow. Um, the ganache is also available in uh, four variants, milk, uh, rich dark, there's a no added sugar as well, and yes. an apple and cinnamon, for people who like a little bit of spice. Yeah, very interesting flavour pairings. That's also something <laughs> very great that Fabel does, is these interesting flavours that you wouldn't usually associate with chocolate. Uh, and they put them in there and it just works so well. Enough so of the chocolate. <laughs> now I think yeah. people are waiting <laughs> for the dessert to be pleated. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about your iconic dessert? Sure, I would love to. So in Australia, um, we love our desserts, um, as we do here. Uh, and I have another trivia question, actually. We have another bag left. Anyone knows what that dessert is? Oh, so wow. we need more bags, I think. <laughs> I think we need more bags. <laughs> I don't know who was first there. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> For you. Well done. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I think that was a tie. Thanks. It's only fair, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. You'll enjoy that. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. So as we found out uh, very quickly, that is a pavlova. Um, it's quite an iconic Australian dessert. Um, has a bit of an interesting history. Um, there's a little bit of a rivalry, or quite a large rivalry, I would say, between New Zealand and Australia as to uh, who invented the pavlova. Uh, many stories, many theories, but I, of course, think it was Australian. Uh, <laughs> so the story behind the pavlova was an interesting one. Uh, again, mer many variations on that story, but um, basically it was a Russian ballerina called oh. Anna Pavlova and she travelled to Australia in the 20s uh, and it was said that a chef that saw her uh, was struck by her beauty and struck by her tutu which was the ballerina skirt. Yeah, if anyone's um, watched Black Swan yes. then you would know what a tutu is. The it's ballerina. a light uh, skirt that the ballerinas wear which yes. inspired that light airy dessert. Yeah, so I he right? was so struck by her beauty um, that he decided to make her a dessert and the pavlova was created. It's a very light, uh, very rich, but um, also a very beautiful dessert. So I think that's a really nice story with where that dessert came from. Uh, what we're doing today is recreating that pavlova. Uh, and what we want to do is make the hero of this recreation chocolate, of course. Uh, so, working with um, the Fabel chocolatiers, the master chocolatiers, uh, I've been able to um, use chocolate in a way that this dessert's completely transformed and it's almost fully chocolate pavlova. So, I think, yeah, you're going to enjoy this one, I think. First, we uh, will be making the meringue, mm -hmm. which is made with egg whites, caster sugar or icing <coughs> sugar, mm -hmm. and to stabilize it, a little bit of lemon juice. So we already have in this KitchenAid mixture some mixture of egg whites and sugar, mm -hmm. but we will be whisking it just to add that air back into the mixture so we can pipe it beautifully for you. We don't want to make too much noise so we won't take long. 
Uh, so what we're going to do uh, is make a small pavlova. Traditionally, pavlovas are basically plate size. They're a big dessert that is shared, um, shared by family, shared by friends. For me, it was always a Christmas dessert. So uh, summertime fruits on top, like mangoes and berries, um, whipped cream, passion fruit, all of the fruits on top. And it was a great sharing dessert. I'll always remember it from my childhood. Uh, and even now, it's something that I still make at Christmas time. Uh, but what we've done is we've um, decided to do small, small pavlovas so that it can be a plated dessert. Uh, so what we're going to do is pipe the meringue around these moulds. Uh, we can do it freehand. It's a bit more risky to do it freehand, I think. Um, but if you wanted to have a very consistent um, lot of these meringues, then definitely doing it on a mould is the way to can mould um, that's used for many different things. Uh, where cases. Uh, we won't be cooking them today because uh, I think that takes about six hours in the oven and I don't think we all want to sit here for that long. Uh, but we do have some already made that we can share with you. So let's just start with that and uh, get piping. Okay. So the second tip that I learned as well in MasterChef um, was to how to hold the bag. Uh, I was holding it very awkwardly in the first few times I used it in challenges because it's all pretty scary. I hadn't done anything like this before. I'd only made home sort of style meals. Uh, and so I was holding it in a, in a very sort of awkward way. But what I learned was to hold it with one hand, twist it around so that you've got full control like that and then you're ready to pipe. You can use your free hand to guide it. So uh, I think we can see this, can we? So basically just want to go around the bottom and follow, follow all the way up to the top until you get a little bit of a nest shape. You can also use different um, sized nozzle heads, different shaped nozzles. Uh, this one's the star nozzle, so it sort of gives it those ridges on the edge and makes it um, quite pretty. So did you want to have a go? No, <laughs> no pressure. Oh, you can make a mess. You can do what you want. <laughs> so if you hold it, hold your hand out like that, yeah, and then like that, and squeeze with that hand. And then so you can use this hand then to sort of help guide it. So if you hold it upright more, then, yeah, I reckon... Might do one better than mine here, I think. <laughs> beautiful. It's such a beautiful mixture meringue. It's one of my favourite things to make, actually, and <coughs> eat. It's a nice thing to uh, lick the bowl where you finish. Um, used for many different applications. Look at that. See? Perfect. I think round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And as we mentioned earlier, um, there are some meringues out in the uh, cocoa journey room that we can actually plate our own dessert out there. So that's going to be pretty exciting. You can all have a yes, go at so doing Yes, so everyone here gets to plate their own dessert, mm -hmm. Billy's iconic dessert, in their own way because we have all the elements. We have a plating station at the end of the cocoa journey where you can plate your own dessert. Yes. 
the I same pavlova the same one so and you can add different toppings yes. to your liking you customize it make the same dessert and that will be amazing beautiful so what we would usually do uh, after this is uh, put these in the oven a very low oven uh, for 4 to 6 hours depending At on how big 60 to 80 degrees for 6 mm -hmm. hours this would give the pavlova or the meringue its texture of crisp outside and absolutely gooey and chewy inside. Yes, which is exactly what a pavlova is. It has that crisp shell with that nice soft inside. Right. Uh, so that's what we do with those. Um, we'll put those away and what we're going to do is move on to the mousse, <coughs> which is going to be, I think, one of the good parts of this dessert. Uh, so it's a chocolate mousse. Yes. We're going to demonstrate the chocolate mousse for you, but it's also a uh, for this dessert, we're making a passion fruit mousse as well, which we've made earlier. Uh, so what we're going to do is demonstrate the mousse. Um, we've got the ganache, chocolate ganache, which yep. Chef is just warming up a little bit for us now, um, and some whipped cream. And that's just sort of folding those together um, to create really light mousse. Uh, so what we'll do, how we're we going? Some cream some into cream. the bowl. Beautiful and a little bit of ganache as well. And we'll fold that through. Uh, chocolate mousse actually evokes a lot of memories for me. Um, quite a scary memory, actually. One part. One part of the ganache. Yes, beautiful. Uh, so the chocolate mousse story for me, uh, does everyone remember Marco from MasterChef, the big, scary Marco? Yeah, so... Uh, there was You're a telling them about their master chef yes, experience? Yes, there was a challenge where um, I was in a team with Georgia. So she was the um, girl that came runner up. Uh, and we were cooking for 40 people a three course meal. Um, we got to the dessert and realized that we only had 36. So we were missing four desserts and we had no white chocolate mousse left. Couldn't find the desserts anywhere. Not sure what happened to them or if we just didn't count properly. Um, but what we did was... Um, Can I add a little more chocolate? Oh, that looks beautiful. Uh, so what we had to do was come up with a chocolate mousse recipe with 10 minutes to go. Um, and we hadn't even finished plating all the rest of the desserts. So what we did was we whipped some cream and melted some white chocolate, folded that together... <coughs> And it was the most beautiful white chocolate mousse. I don't know why we didn't use that recipe in the beginning. Um, but of course, it was, it was made very scary by Marco standing behind us, uh, sort of pushing us along, getting a little bit angry. Um, but I'll never forget that recipe because it's something I use all the time now uh, because it's such a quick, quick dessert idea. It's great for parties, um, served in a glass and set in the fridge. Easy, easy dinner party dessert. Very easy. Yeah. So we're folding through the whipped cream and the ganache. Uh, light hand, quick sort of movements so that you end up with a very um, smooth, airy sort of texture in the finished mousse. Uh, you are going to be able to, to taste some chocolate mousse next door as well. So there's a lot of exciting things um, waiting for you next door. Uh, so how's that looking? It's looking very good. It's coming together. I um, think we need a little more chocolate. A little more chocolate. Always need a little more chocolate, I think. <laughs> it's beautiful. And what we're going to do after this is actually show you the plating of the dessert. So I think that's one of the most <coughs> fun parts of doing all of this is actually plating up the dessert. So maybe we'll get that ready. Um, and, yeah, we'll start doing that. Any experience about chocolate that you would like to share? Oh, so many. Some childhood actually. memory, something. Well, I think mostly just with MasterChef, there's, there's a lot of stories. Um, I guess they're the memories that stick out the most when it comes to cooking anyway. Um, but chocolate especially, cooking with chocolate in the MasterChef kitchen was very temperamental, I guess. The atmosphere in the kitchen was very hot. Um, sometimes it was really cold, depending on what month it was. Uh, so working with chocolate, even mousses and this sort of thing, was um, quite risky because if it was too warm in the room, it all melted. But if it was too cold, then you couldn't sort of get the correct consistency. So those sort of memories will always stick with me. 
Um, and they're great tips too when you're uh, working with chocolate. Just got to keep an eye on temperature, time, um, and if you do that, then you'll have something good. So, so what we're going to do so is the mousse has come along, as you can see. Yeah, the it's chocolate all come is together. evenly uh, spread. Beautiful, and it's still light. It's still it's airy. still very light. Yeah, beautiful. It's very light. So I think we might start plating the dessert now. Definitely. And then we can all move in and try some chocolate. So let's get this started. I think we have it all ready to go here. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. This is the fun part. I think this is what this is what makes it. So some of this. Ah, so this is the passion fruit mousse we were talking about. Um, beautiful colour, really tart, uh, so it goes really well with the chocolate flavours and sort of cuts through that chocolate mousse as well, so nothing's too rich. So the chocolate mousse is basically made with uh, your passion fruit puree, or you, if you find fresh passion fruit, then the passion fruit gel, and white chocolate, cream. Equal parts of white chocolate and the cream, you boil the cream, put some white chocolate, let it melt, and then add the passion fruit puree. And off the flame, <coughs> not on the flame. So you boil the cream a little bit, then put it off the flame, put some chocolate, mm -hmm. let it melt, some uh, passion fruit inside it, a paste or a jelly, and then fold in the whipped cream with a very light hand. And then let it chill. So your passion fruit mousse will be ready. If you want, you can put it in a piping bag, or you can put it in uh, molds or glasses, and then set it. And you can garnish it with anything and it will be a perfect dessert. Yeah, that's another easy sort of dinner party dessert as yes. well, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Very nice. So these are the uh, meringue shells that we've had. And what we've done is dipped them in chocolate, just to add a little bit more chocolate for you. Um, so they're the base of this pavlova dessert. Um, we've got some raspberry coolie, which um, is there for a few reasons. Uh, it's a beautiful colour. So it goes really well um, with this plate. Uh, it also is, a raspberry is one of the fundamental fruits that you put on top of a pavlova, um, as is uh, blueberries. Um, Which are incidentally from Australia as well. They are from Australia, so we've got yeah a bit of a theme happening here, don't we? Uh, and strawberries as well. So passion fruit is another um, definite yes for a pavlova. Uh, the flavour of it just goes so well. Um, with the meringue, but also with the chocolate. <laughs> Passion fruit and chocolate is match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is um, paint the coolie across the plate um, to start doing this. There's many ways you could do this, uh, and you can experiment when you get to plate. Um, you could splat it on. Maybe not. You might make too much of a mess, but paint it across the plate is what we're going to do. So we'll start with that. I hope you can all see. I think a little bit more. It is a beautiful colour um, and will go really well, I think, with the chocolate and meringue shell. Okay. I think this one looks pretty nice. Do you? We'll use that one? Yes. Lovely. Okay. So what we're going to do is pipe in the uh, chocolate mousse um, about halfway up the shell so then we can pipe again with the passion fruit mousse. Very nice. Plating is one of my favourite things to do, actually. Uh, I always made sure in MasterChef that I left enough time to plate at the end. So if it was an hour challenge, I'd treat it as a 50-minute challenge, save at least 10 minutes at the end to plate up the dessert. Um, because they say we eat with our eyes, and if a dish looks really good, then I think you're going to want to eat it. So uh, very important. Very nice. And we top with the passion fruit. And then we get to put the fruit on top. It's one of my favourite things to do with a pavlova. The decorating of it, even as a, a young child, was uh, putting the fruit and everything on top. <coughs> very exciting. It has. So these are the seeds. So the seeds are getting stuck because oh, of the... Oh, okay. So we needed a little bit of a uh, push. Yeah. We can get them through. Very nice. And then we're going to top it with the blueberries, uh, the strawberries. Uh, we've also made some sour cherry confit. Uh, so it's basically uh, sour cherries cooked for a very long time. 
which is like a comfy, um, which is a comfy. Um, and then there's a little bit of gelatin added so that it creates these little tiny, that almost look like a cherry themselves um, and have a nice sour little tart taste and just go perfectly on top of this dessert. So we'll start decorating, I think. What do you think? Will you use these? Yes, All we'll right. use the tweezers. Lovely. Okay. So blueberries. I think we might. Let's go a little bit more passion fruit mousse. Okay. No, we can't. <laughs> All right. Almost. There we go. Okay. So blueberries. Start with blueberries. Use that to neaten it up a little bit. I can put more blueberry on top. <coughs> yeah, that would look nice. <coughs> Beautiful. Okay. Lovely, so that's enough of those. We'll go the strawberries. Can everyone see? We all see how it's coming <coughs> together? So with a pavlova, of course, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't use these and you'd be a little bit yes, more... Yes, you would be more rustic and just yeah. put chopped yeah. fruits on top of it. But what we want, we want to make this look, look really special, so that's why we'd take a little bit longer to decorate it. How many of you have eaten pavlova? Just the authentic pop, pavlova. You've had it? Do you like it? Yeah. It's quite fresh. I think it's a good dessert to have, especially in the warmer months. Um, it's really, um, well, it's really quite a summer dessert, I suppose, in Australia <coughs> especially. Okay, so we'll what I did notice is that you've paired a lot of fruits with, in the original recipe, you've paired a lot of fruits with the chocolate. So, no, yeah. do you like fruits with chocolate? I do. I think it's a great way, um, a great way to eat chocolate. Uh, berries especially, berries go especially well with chocolate, um, which I guess was um, my thought process behind uh, doing this pavlova because of <coughs> all the ingredients in the original dish all go really well with chocolate. So. so we're going to actually pipe a little bit more mousse around the outside as well. And this so is a coffee jelly which she's, uh, chef is using right now, which yeah. is made with coffee, sugar and a little bit of gelatin. So you can make your coffee and just let add gelatin to it and let it just cool. And it is just something a little bit more special, isn't it? Added to the pavlova, uh, just to give it a little bit more of uh, that bitter flavor from the coffee, which pairs really, really well with chocolate. So it's starting to come together and looking good. I bet you're all looking forward to tasting the chocolate next door, I'm sure. Beautiful, beautiful setup. It'd be, be very nice. Okay, we'll finish with a little bit of passion fruit on the top there. And then we're nearly done. Okay, bit of mint, and we're ready to go. Okay. What do you think? I think it looks pretty great. Good. Okay. So this well is our final plate for the Pavlova Chef Billy's <laughs> creation with Fabel chocolates. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. I think uh, Australia uh, you know, fell in love with Pavlova in the 1920s. And we hope that we all you know, fall in love with Fabel's very own version of Pavlova, you know, especially around the world. Uh, so a very 